Um, welcome to everyone who is just joining us. We will begin very, very shortly. We're just going to wait for a few more of you to filter through. But I am super excited to be the moderator for today's event. My name is Ehi and I work here at HackerJob. And I'm super delighted to be the one who will be helping to moderate Driving the Future of Inclusivity, Women Leading the Way in Tech, in partnership with LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group. So um, I'll give you first a bit more of an introduction to both HackerJob and LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group, um, a few housekeeping rules, and then the speakers will introduce themselves and we'll get started with today's event. So a bit more about HackerJob. We are a data-driven and engaging recruitment platform operating in the digital sector. We use key data points to find candidates' jobs uniquely based on their CV and skill sets. And this ensures that actually both candidates and companies can conduct a much more relevant and targeted approach to recruitment. Beyond that, we also offer support before and after interviews, as well as offering candidates to show off their skills through coding challenges and project uploads. So now you've had a little bit about HackerJob, how about LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group? Well, they provide customers in more than 180 countries with market-specific solutions, technologies, decision tools, and data services to give their customers the clear advantage in evaluating and predicting risk and enhancing operational efficiency. But don't just take it from me, very soon you'll actually be able to hear from the wonderful women who actually work um, at Lexis Nexus, gosh, wow, what a tongue twister, a risk solutions group um, and subsidiaries as well. So just before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping rules. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, Basically, all we have is a Q&A feature, which will come at the end. So if you notice at the bottom, it says Q&A, this is where you can submit all of your questions um, rather than raising your hand, just so that this can flow a bit more smoothly. It's easy to put it in the Q&A because we do have dedicated time to go through your questions towards the end of the event as well. So just a reminder, please put all questions into Q&A as we will not be taking any raising of hands um, at the beginning during the speeches. Hope this works. So having said that, and without further ado, um, I will let the very first speaker introduce herself. Jennifer, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully you can see the right screen. <laughs> OK, <Yeah>. cool. <laughs> so hi, yeah, I'm Jenny, and I am a data scientist at Sirium, which is one of the areas within LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group. I'm going to call that RSG because it is a mouthful. Um, and today I will be talking briefly to you all about what data science is and some of the work that we do here at RSG. So to start with, um, here's just a little bit about me and my journey into the current role that I am. Um, I studied maths at the University of Leeds. I didn't really have a career in mind um, at that point. I just knew that maths came naturally to me um, and I enjoyed it. I actually had not heard of data science at that point in my life, um, although now I do believe a lot of degrees actually cater to solely data science. Um, my first job straight out of university, um, I worked analysing life and pension funds for a big insurance company. Um, I found quite quickly that it wasn't really for me. Um, I didn't think I was being challenged enough. And I actually missed the problem solving element that was in my maths degree. Um, so that's when I started looking at different career options for myself and I came across data science and the RSG graduate program. So with the RSG data science program, um, I started in 2018 and the program consists of two years and it allows you to rotate across different parts within the company. So my first year was spent with ICIS, which is looking at chemical and commodity data. And my second year was with Sirium, which is centered around aviation. And I stayed with Sirium after the scheme because I found it a good fit for me. Um, the good thing that attracted me as well to the scheme was they didn't require me to have any prior data science or coding knowledge. Um, they just liked the fact that I was willing to learn and had an analytical mindset. And um, so that was good because I hadn't had much exposure to that previously, um, data science that is. Um, and the scheme's very hands-on, so you learn pretty fast while you're working, straight into projects. But also there's a lot of help and resources if you need it. And within the scheme, I was able to travel to quite a few of the different 
RSG offices around the world. So I spent some time in Germany and in the United States, and then hopefully that'll pick up again soon. So what actually is data science? Some people describe it as the sweet spot in between domain expertise, programming skills, and knowledge of maths and statistics, which was handy for me given my degree background, but I do know a lot of data scientists who come from various different disciplines, so it's not a prerequisite at all. Um, but essentially, data science aims to extract meaningful insights out of large amounts of data and then use these insights to help drive businesses to make better decisions and create more innovative products and services. So that was the aim of data science, but what is actually involved in the role? Uh, mainly we work in code. Um, Python still remains one of the top coding languages, although quite a lot of people do prefer to use R. And SQL is pretty common, basically in anywhere that houses data. So we'll be using that for reading, writing, and manipulating data within databases. Um, projects often involve trying to identify trends and patterns. And these are often found through model building, through maybe machine learning or deep learning, for examples, and then using these models to predict and classify data. Data science is actually a branch of artificial intelligence, which is the concept of teaching computers how to mimic human behavior. And often quite a lot of time is spent cleaning and engineering your data to get it useful for modeling, um, which means a lot of analyzing and um, really understanding and getting to grips with the data that you're using. Also, visualization is pretty important, especially when you're trying to describe your results to other areas of the business, which might not be as data minded as you, so they're always helpful. And at the end of the day, the insights from data science are only beneficial to a business if they can be interpreted. And so being able to present and tell a story around the data is a really important skill to have. Um, I found that data science has been quite a collaborative role as well, um, and I've worked with multiple teams across the business, including product, technology, and um, marketing. And so as your career develops skills around communication and project management, they come quite naturally on the job. So, as I mentioned previously, Sirium is all around aviation, and we aim to deliver data and analytics within the aviation industry. And so, we carry a huge amount of data around the subject. And some of these data sets, but not all of these, are. So, we have data around schedules. So, that's everything that your flight is planning to do, and we get updates daily about whether or not they're going to change. Fleet, they contain everything from what engine your aircraft's going to use, to how big the wings are, to how many seats are on your plane. Traffic, so we can see how many passengers are flying from A to B at a given point in the year. Flight history, so what actually happened on your flight while it was in the air. Um, positions, so every couple of seconds we have data on exactly where your aircraft and flight was, um, so lat long, altitude, speed, etc. And then also we have a lot of data around the weather because quite obviously, not obviously, but um, weather has a huge impact on what goes on in the air and flights around that. And so some of the big questions that we're trying to answer within the aviation industry in our team are things such as, can we predict how long your flight will be delayed? And we're trying to do that to the minute. Um, how likely is your flight schedule going to change? And we're trying to predict that quite far in advance so you know what's going to happen. Um, say we have two flights, A and B, why is one preferred more by customers to others? Uh, when will your aircraft need maintenance and checks to show that it is flight ready? And also how many carbon emissions does my flight produce? Of course, there's been a huge impact to the aviation industry due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Practically overnight, flights were canceled and aircraft were grounded. Um, and nearly two years on, we still haven't returned to the levels we were seeing pre-pandemic in terms of flights. The current estimates don't expect to see this until 2025. And so this has considerably impacted our data and patterns that we were seeing before the pandemic aren't there anymore. And there are these new patterns that we're trying to uncover. So one of the main challenges within our team is trying to model these changes so that we can actually serve the industry really well. Um, and just to finish up, I want to talk briefly about what might be coming up in data science in the next couple of years. 
Um, so there are new tools coming out which make data science much more accessible to the masses um, by offering low slash no code solutions for machine learning. Big companies such as Amazon and Google are investing a lot in this space, which means more companies and small businesses who wouldn't have had access to data science before can start using the capabilities of it. Um, but having said that, does this new tool, meaning that AI and machine learning will eventually replace human work? The answer is probably not anytime soon. Um, AI technology is nowhere near as advanced as what is seen in like science fiction films. Um, and it's still limited to the programs and the code that run it. Um, so we do still need humans to actually do the coding. Um, there are also some ethical considerations to consider when it comes to AI. Um, AI can learn bias, and there have been examples of it learning gender and race bias. Um, a recent example that comes to mind is Google Translate, who just last year were accused of being gender biased. Um, there were some instances when it was translating from some languages into English, and then the tool was assigning pronouns, which would be considered gender stereotypes. So he works, she does the laundry, he plays sports, she takes care of the children. Um, Google did not program this to behave this way on purpose at all. It was something that it naturally picked up by itself, just by the data that was fed into the system. Um, another thing is, can you teach AI to make a moral decision? Take self-driving cars, for example, and if the situation came up that the brakes were failing, um, the only option for the car could be to travel straight forward and hit a pedestrian, or the car could swerve and crash into a wall and then harm the people inside the car. How do you teach a computer to make that sort of decision? Um, and also the area of natural language processing, um, which is the ability for machines to understand human language. Uh, this continues to evolve because humans um, use nuances, context, and are very ambiguous when they're speaking. Um, NLP exists already day to day um, in things such as Alexa and chat boxes, um, but the applications can be taken further to detect things like fake news articles, and combat cyberbullying, both of which are very relevant in the world today. Um, that is all for me. So thank you for listening. And I'm going to pass over to Sophie. Thank you very much, Jenny. Can you all my slides? Yeah, OK. Um, so yeah, hi, everybody. My name is Sophie Travise. And I'm actually really excited to be speaking at this webinar today. Um, I myself have joined multiple of these sort of things over the years. And the ones that I have found most valuable are the ones that um, I can really relate to. And so my hope for today is that um, if you are at some sort of kind of pivotal career point or maybe looking for the next direction, if something that I've said today can provide um, at least some food thought um, in your next decision, then that to me um, is a success. Um, so today, my talk is really going to be based around my career journey so far at LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group, really talking about my transition from um, back when I was kind of a physics student working in technology, um, right the way through now to um, my role as a senior program manager. So firstly, to just give a bit of an overview of my um, career journey, um, as I said, it really started um, back in 2012. I was a physics student um, completing a physics degree at the University of Bath. The university um, offers a year in industry, and that was where I really first started applying for roles within technology. Um, I secured my placement with LexisNexis um, as a kind of very junior analyst. I completed the year, um, but what was great about it was that um, by the time I'd completed it, I'd actually been offered the position um, as a graduate analyst. And so I went back, completed my physics degree, and then returned as a graduate analyst. I then really kind of worked my way up from there, um, was working um, as a junior analyst, working with software engineering teams, um, kind of progressing up in terms of role and responsibility. I would say that 2018 was really the most kind of pivotal point for my career, which was where I secured a role at Sirium. So as you've just met Jenny, um, Sirium isn't outside of the group, it's actually within the group and we just operate within it. So it's kind of a smaller brand within, within the larger group. Um, Sirium is a world leader in aviation and travel data. Um, we supply nearly, I think, nearly 100% of the world's um, 50 biggest airline groups. 
Um, so yeah, we really operate in this space. Um, so my role was very much an analyst um, and I was surrounded by kind of a really great leadership team and great people um, and very quickly was promoted to a senior analyst um, and then promoted to um, more of that of kind of an end and delivery manager and very recently have been promoted to that of a senior program manager. Um, and so I'm now 27, but I'm managing um, my own team of global project managers as well. And so really the next couple of slides are based around just my journey. Um, it hasn't all been completely smooth sailing, um, trying to navigate the tech industry as a young female, but ultimately I feel very lucky to be at LexisNexis. So to kind of categorize um, maybe some of the struggles that I had kind of earlier on my career, the first was definitely the perception of a lack of direction. As a young analyst, I had no real idea in terms of how to answer the, where do you want to be in a year, five years, 10 years time? Um, I was extremely motivated um, and very hardworking, but I didn't really have a plan. And at the time I thought that that was to my detriment, but now looking back, I realized that that is absolutely fine. Um, that is okay. Uh, the next was kind of my tech and data knowledge. This might sound strange given that um, I'm talking to you about my technology career to a room full of um, technical professionals. However, what I mean by this is that I didn't follow the traditional um, route in terms of I didn't do a computer science degree and I'm not a software engineer. And so I used to worry about the conversation potentially straying to become too technical. Um, but actually now looking back on it, I realized that you really trust your technical context for that. And then the layer of kind of strategic insight, people leadership and ability to kind of galvanize teams around a common goal and working with the technical context, that's where, um, that's where the true success really happens. And so now looking back on it, it should never really have been a worry and more just an appreciation of skill sets. Um, and the final kind of bucket, I guess, is um, credibility. I think as a very, very junior female in technology, um, I would often join more senior meetings to present the status of a project. And at the time, I kind of felt like the senior leaders would be looking to um, kind of the senior architect next to me or the senior engineering manager next to me for their comment and to ask them the questions rather than directing them at me. Um, at the time, I found this incredibly frustrating and it's something that kind of used to um, confuse me a lot. But now looking back on it, I do just see it was more a sense of being incredibly junior at the time um, and kind of they were looking for the seniority rather than it being kind of anything else. Uh, just to kind of finish up with these, these three buckets really kind of categorize um, any issues I did have. But ultimately, I have now reached a point that um, I'm already really proud of in my career. Um, I am only 27, but kind of leading a global team of project managers um, and I'm able to make a real impact at Sirium. And there have been some things along the way that have really helped me excel my career. And these are kind of categorized on this screen here. Um, the first I would say um, is a really, really important thing to help you excel in your career is company alignment. I feel incredibly lucky to work for Sirium and LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group. Um, there are so many opportunities here if, if you want them. So there are kind of secondment opportunities, travel opportunities. We are truly global. We have offices all over the world. Um, lots of career development opportunities, training. Um, if you are someone that wants to succeed, LexisNexis is very much kind of always there and has helped me through each step of my career. The next is mentorship and senior advocates. Um, I mentioned before, I'm not really the sort of person for kind of a one, five, 10 year plan. Um, what I think is, um, if you have those goals, that is absolutely incredible. But I think what is also equally as important is kind of surrounding yourself with mentors and senior advocates that you can really learn from. They can guide you through certain areas that you maybe not haven't navigated through before. Um, so that I think is a really, really important part. The next one is personal brand. And this one may sound obvious, but something that I've really tried to focus on um, over the last couple of years is kind of how I'm coming across. So whether it's just a meeting, whether I'm facilitating a meeting, um, whether I'm providing a status report, I always try and go above and beyond whatever I'm producing. Um, that I think all just adds to your general personal brand, especially if you are in a large organization like I am. Um, my advice would be don't underestimate the power of a reputation that you can have. Um, and the final point, um, which really leads on to my final slide is just explore every opportunity. Um, 
even if they aren't quite the path that you potentially had in mind. So for example, what I'm gonna say and kind of closing statements is um, don't be afraid of a diverse career. So I very recently transitioned kind of away from the technology division to essentially the operations division at Syrium. And I took kind of maybe two months, maybe even three months to kind of make that decision, um, really because I was scared of moving away from technology. That's kind of where my career had been for the last six years, I guess. Um, and I had a very open and honest chat with my manager at the time. Um, and the first point he made was, look, so you can change your mind. Um, you don't always have to just make your decision in your career and stick with it. You can change your mind. Um, and the second important point he made to me was actually, if you go and take this role and you excel in it, if anything, that will make you more attractive as a future technology leader because of that kind of well-rounded experience I would gain. Um, and that is actually incredibly true. Some of the world's largest organizations actually structure their company through these sort of job rotations. Um, for example, ExxonMobil, if you join them as an analyst, two years later, they may rotate you towards their strategy division. Another two later, they may rotate you into sales um, or trading. And the reason why they do this is because um, they want to build future well-rounded leaders. Um, and so you may be thinking, do you know what? I'm a software engineer. I, I don't know if it's quite as simple as that. Um, but I would still argue that some of the best software engineers I personally have worked with are extremely well-rounded in their views in terms of kind of architecture, security, DevOps, as well as kind of having that commercial understanding. Um, and so if you are interested in exploring these sort of areas, my advice would be um, don't worry about that being a limitation as it will probably work in your favor in the long run. And that is really everything I wanted to talk through. So thank you so much for listening. And I am really excited to answer any questions that you may have um, once we've kind of got through all the speakers today. And I believe I am now handing over to Angela. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angela Hortsford, and I am a director of software engineering at LexisNexus Resolutions Group. And I'm here to share with you how truly I enjoy the challenges, the problem solving, and the hunt for a solution that a career in technology can bring to, to all of us. And I'm going to share with you what my current role is today at LexisNexus. Uh, I particularly work in the big data, data engineering department. And in there, we get data from its raw format. And we get thousands of, of sources in its raw format. And we translate them into information that then can help our customers make very smart decisions. In my group, we are focused on um, the, what in tech we will call the ETL process, which is extract, transfer, and load. And then we apply a variety of filters, we fill, in information that uh, it may be missing in data. We clean up data, uh, we make it searchable. And one very important thing that we do with our data is we link it. And if you have ever uh, looked at LexisNexus products, we um, own a technology called the LexID and BIP linking, and that gives us the ability to link all the different information to an entity. And that really gives us a, a very powerful solution to our customers because data, if you have ever worked in data, data is dirty, data has a lot of different intricacies into it that is very difficult sometimes to pinpoint it to the right individual or to the right businesses or entity. So that really is, is a very powerful technology that we have here at LexisNexus and that gives us an edge to produce cutting edge products that allows our customers to make very smart decisions. Uh, the, the data that we process is, is, is petadata of data. It's uh, large data. The technology that allows us to, to do that uh, powerhouse is HPCC. That is a technology that was developed in-house. And that gives a, a, it's a true testament of how innovative the company is. Um, um, 
up to date you know, throughout the years, it has it continues to be relevant, it continues to evolve, is now open source and allows us to crunch to thousands, millions and billions of records every day in a very fast manner. The data that we produce, um, so we come from that a pyramid of knowledge, we start with very raw data, then we transform it to information and then that information our products transform into knowledge that can help our customers in a variety of industries to do very good things for society. Uh, we um, are, are key players on uh, fighting crime, preventing fraud, financial inclusion, finding missing children, and very good things that happen uh, in society. So our, our data um, not only helps financial institutions to make uh, smart decisions, but we also help uh, other institutions to make uh, decisions for causes that help society. That's the technical part of my job, uh, but um, I lead a group of about 25 engineers, and I uh, not only help them with uh, technical decisions uh, to find uh, the right architecture, to align them uh, with the right uh, job for their talent, I also uh, help them balance their work and life uh, especially in the last couple of years, I know it has very, been very difficult for everyone. In addition to our jobs, we have taken into roles of uh, being caregivers, helping our children, our children helping our, our parents to stay safe, uh, taking care of family members. Um, that had a lot of, a lot of um, worry and, and, and stress, I think, to our lives. So my, my job is also help employees to have a, a happy life at work so they can also have a happy life at home and balance those uh, finally. The company also has done an outstanding job at helping us balance that, that work-life balance. We have that work-life balance. Um, we are offered many different opportunities uh, to, to focus on our health, in our in not only our physical health but our mental health, which has been also tested in the last couple of years. And um, but in very few words, really my job is to bring the best out of everyone in my team, to, that they bring their best, their, their best talent, that I provide the career opportunities that are aligned for the talent and that I help them grow and be very tech better technologists and to help them uh, really pursue their dreams and reach their potential. And that's uh, probably the biggest part of my job. And now I'm going to move into how I got here. Um, I was born and raised in Guatemala City, and that's a, a country in Central America. And then I moved to Boca Raton, Florida, um, a couple of decades ago. I was in college, in the middle of college, uh, pursuing a career in computer science at the time. And when I moved to, to the United States, and that's where, where I currently am. I was very lucky to be exposed to technology from a very, very young age. I was 16 years old when I joined high school. I did not have any idea at that time of, of I don't know what technology was. I didn't own a computer. And it was just really a lucky shot that I got, I got exposed. I was going to school for accounting, actually. That's what, what, I, what I, I, I thought I was going to do. I had a passion for numbers. But then um, I started taking programming classes and I think that's, that's when, when I got the bug for technology. And ever since um, I pursued a, a career in college in, in technology, in computer science. Um, uh, as many of you know here probably that if to work in technology, you don't really need a, a college degree. Uh, you, can, if you can dive in with a certification or with sometimes very little knowledge of technology. It's, it's really the, the, the problem solving skill that, that can help you get started and that curiosity to learn new things. So I was very lucky that um, I um, was able to work and go to college at the same time I was pursuing my degree in computer science. Uh, I work as a software engineer. Throughout the years, um, I work at different startup companies in different roles uh, as, um, as a programmer uh, or software engineer, as a database administrator, product specialist. I, um, full, I fill even hardware roles. Uh, so I, I wore a lot of different hats in technology. And by the time I joined LexisNexis Resolutions, I had already uh, really focused on data. 
uh, I work for, for companies that manage what I thought at the time was very large data, which was just a few million records. But when then when I came to LexisNexis, I realized that the large data that I was thinking was large data wasn't large enough as compared to LexisNexis. So coming to LexisNexis gave me an opportunity to, to see what big data was, to learn many different tools to manage that data, that big data. Also gave me an opportunity to, to have a lot of teamwork. And I put through probably all, all my roles. I had an unofficial um, leadership role, but was an official. I uh, kind of tried to avoid it. I ha always have an excuse. Oh, you know, I um, I'm, I don't. My English is. I'm not very good with my English. But it may be an excuse. I um, I will. Um, uh, we will wait until my English be gets better uh, as I get practice. And as you can see, I still have a very big accent. <laughs> so it was just excuses that probably that I made to myself to don't jump in an official leadership role. Uh, others could be. Uh, I, I became a mother in the middle of all this, and I thought, you know, I'm a mother. Probably now I should wait, but now with that I look back, um, those are just just some blockers that I that I was putting on myself. And when I started leading people, is when I realized that I am the owner of my career. I am the owner of my destiny, and I need to look for those career opportunities and not wait for for my manager or all the people around me to tell me, Angela, this is an this is an opportunity for you. Um, so I, I, throughout the years, I have learned many things, and one of those things are uh, to to drive my career, and I help others to find their their niche, to find their their happiness in, in their career. So why not do it with myself? So those are things that I learned along the way, and that I hope um, and all of you um, take charge of your career. It's 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 yours. Uh, you can take it any direction you like. Uh, to, uh, going up the, the, the corporate ladder sometimes is not um, it's not uh, the the path that everybody follows. It can be up and down, lateral, uh, in different in different directions, and ultimately uh, that that takes us to to a place of of, of happiness and, and and a place where we want to be. So that's um, that has been my career, Alexis Nexus, and I hope uh, um, I gave you a good insight of of what life at Alexis Nexus is. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have uh, later on. And thank you for your time. And now I'm going to pass it on to Marcia. Hey, thank you, Angela. I think that was really great. And uh, I think we have a theme going here is that there's, you know, a lots of opportunity to follow your passion. And um, so I'm going to um, share my screen here um, and tell you my story. Um, and one of the things I really appreciate about being LexisNexis is there really is that opportunity to really follow your passions. And if you have interest, the, the teams here is uh, uh, really great at supporting you. So am I able to minimize this? Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, it's awesome. Yeah, so today I'm a solutions consultant here at LexisNexis. I'm a fraud and identity subject matter expert. And what I do is I talk to um, senior leaders across all sorts of different industries about uh, their user, ex user experiences. And I help them find uh, ways to protect the company and to protect the user from bad actors and uh, fortify those journeys while still providing a great experience. Um, so really enjoy my job today. How I got here was uh, quite, quite the journey as well. Um, and so uh, what I want to talk to you today is kind of the three points that I'm going to talk to you about as I, as I explain my journey is that one, um, we all have transferable skills. Like just because you're in one job today does not mean you have to stay in that job for the rest of your career. Um, in every job that you have, you're learning and developing skills. And these skills uh, can be applied in a different method, in a different industry, in a different jobs. And um, you were never, you're never trapped where you're at. So I know, uh, I, I've known colleagues that felt like they couldn't do anything else, but I'm telling you now, you know, the, the world is your apple, like you just have to be able to think about the things that you have, inventory them and be able to, you know, think about how they're relevant to other jobs. Um, the other thing that, uh, so another thing that's really important is uh, continuous education to be able to continually develop your skills. 
um, every, the, the world is a changing place. New technology gets introduced every day. Um, the way people approach things is constantly evolving. And um, to really stay relevant in the marketplace, it's important to keep on working on your skills. You're not done with learning once you hit your bachelor's degree or, you know, it's like you, you wanna continually learn about the industry you're in or the tools you're using or what's coming down the road. So being on distribution lists and stuff like that is really helpful to keep you growing your, your personal self and your career. And then um, extracurricular activities is also a really important part about opening new doors. Um, you know, don't be afraid to get involved in things and get involved in things that are interesting to you because um, these extracurricular activities will give you um, additional skills that you're not getting in your current job and they will enable you to take your career to the next level. Um, so just, Taking a, a little bit of step on my journey, um, you know, I'm in a very heavy uh, cybersecurity, very technical role today. And again, like as part of my job, I'm uh, building out um, workflows and uh, advising customers on where our technology fits in their technology. But believe it or not, I started my um, career as an artist. I got a degree in um, fine arts uh, in doing illustration. Um, I also um, started my family pretty young, like uh, as soon as I graduated from college, I was already getting married and having kids. So my first eight years of my adulthood, I guess, is that I was taking care of the kids primarily, but I also wanted to supplement my income with um you know, supplement our income with with work, and and so I was dabbling in a in a bunch of different things. So I did some freelance art. Um, I I had translation skills from when I was um, being an um, an exchange student in high school. Um, so I dabbled a little bit in translation services. Um, I also my husband was also doing a master's program in computer science, and so he taught me how to do web development. So I was also doing some freelance web development, and this is back in the HTML. 1.0 days. And so I just kind of dabbled in these different things. Um, and as my kids get older, I, you know, I was ready to get into the workplace. And I was trying to figure out what skills were most relevant. And um, to, so for my first job, what I did um, is I had taken a translation certificate program that helped me get kind of like that freelance translation work. Um, but there was a proofreading job with GNC, the vitamin company, and they wanted somebody who could proofread in Spanish and French and English. And I'm like, oh, I've got like language skills. I can do this. Um, and I interviewed and I got the job. And then I was like, I, I hope I know what a proofreader does. But I thought translation would be the same. But just to be safe, I went to the bookstore and I got a proofreading book and I went through every exercise in the book so that I could hit the ground running uh, day one. And it, it turned out it was kind of funny because I was able to proofread and I put all the correct comments, but the people who were actually interpreting my stuff actually didn't know what proofreading was, uh, the, the actual remarks. So it was kind of an education process for them as well as me, but it was interesting. Anyway, that job um, had times when it was slow and times where it was fast. And so on the times where I didn't have as much work to do. I was working with um, the different groups. Uh, like I'd go to the marketing department. Hey, can I help you out with your marketing copy? I'd go to our UX team and say, hey, can I develop, you know, can I help you make these labels and work with the computers? And so I started developing these extra skills when I had less work to do with my normal day job. And this really helped because um, there was a job that came up in the IT department that was an applications administrator. And at that time, um, they were mostly a mainframe shop. Uh, everybody there was working on JCL, hard coding, mainframe language. And they were starting to introduce cutting edge new technology. They were introducing ERP systems and uh, you know, enterprise resource planning systems and CRM systems, customer uh, resource management systems. And um, they had their marketing campaigns that were kind of using this GUI tool. And they had EDI, which was electronic data interchange. And um, they had a document management workflow solution. All these were GUI based tools. And um, their IT department, that was all 
new technology that they weren't comfortable with. And so they needed somebody who could manage these applications. And so there was myself and one other girl. I, I, I applied for the job and um, the CIO really liked the fact that I had just dabbled in all this stuff. And he's like, yeah, that's what we need. We need an open mindset uh, for this role. And so I got this applications administrator job and it was so funny, it was actually the lowest job on the totem pole, like I was beneath the secretary and I even had to deliver mail to all the IT people. Um, but that wasn't necessarily a bad thing because I started developing relationships with the, all the people, the, the DBAs, the directors of the, the hardware systems. And so as I deliver this mail, I'd talk to people about their jobs and what they were doing and what that looked like. And in my role, because I own this cutting edge technology, I was learning things that were really relevant to the future. I was learning how uh, these systems operated, the back end, the front end, and how they, they came together. And in fact, with one of my applications, I was um, owning a, a document management system which had workflows, uh, which could pretty much solve any uh, business process. And uh, the programming for that was all point and click configuration. And so in that, with that tool, um, I would go and interview different business departments. I'd be like, hey, what's your business challenge? I bet our solution can solve it. And I would build, um, I, I would pretty much do every role in the project plan. So I was kind of like the business development person identifying departments that had a need. Um, I was the business analyst documenting what their problem is and what that need looked like and how we could potentially solve it. Um, I was the uh, developer building, uh, this was back in the waterfall, waterfall days versus agile. Um, I built um, high level design documents saying, hey, this is what the solution's gonna look like. And I would review it with that business unit. And then I'd, do the detailed design. And then I would build the solution with the point and click configuration. And then I would build my test plan so that I would test it to make sure it was working well. And then I would um, test it. And then to deploy it, I'd, I'd be in charge of deploying scanners. Um, I'd create training materials and I trained the user. So I pretty much did everything in the project life cycle, uh, which was great skill building to turn into an IT project manager. Um, so when I move companies, um, so I started out, you know, with my freelance and e-commerce and GNC, that was a totally a retail company. Once I had all these great project management skills, I was actually able to take that and translate that into a project manager job at a telecom company. I worked for Time Warner Cable and there um, I was I started off as a managing the same document management workflow system, but they had actually hired a team of consultants to do the work. So I wasn't responsible for developing anymore. I was responsible for taking the technology and taking it through the different environments, the development environment, the QA environment, and then into production. So documenting everything at each stage and making sure everybody knew what they needed to do to get this thing into production. But as I developed the project management skills, I started getting bigger and bigger projects that were related to different things. And in fact, one of my projects was this huge uh, multi-million dollar effort where I was deploying uh, call center technology, uh, cutting edge uh, call center technology, um, CTI, computer telephony integration, which was cutting edge at the time. And um, working with different divisions across the country. And I'd work with the server guys, I'd work with the DBA guys, I'd work with the, the telecom um, uh, server management guys. So I was developing this full understanding of what, because I, I had been in a role where I had done everything from end to end in a project life cycle as a project manager, I knew what every player in uh, the project needed to be successful. And that job, I did that for quite a while, but that uh, job then um, opened up an opportunity uh, in banking. Um, so my first role in banking, it was sort of a transitional role where I took these great project management skills I had and I built out um, a, a program management um, office with our call center in, um, in a different location. So basically I provided a structure to help projects go through. I'd have a mini workbook where they, I helped people describe like what it is that they want to get into production. I helped them do release management and um, I helped them put structure around things because it would be like, 
before I joined and be like, we want to do this. Uh, the product team would say, and the implementation team would be like, okay. But then as the workload got uh, busier, they couldn't keep track of what was in releases anymore. And so I put the structure in place that enabled the product managers to communicate clearly to the project team and for the project team to be able to manage their resources so they could deploy uh, correctly. But once that infrastructure was in place, that opened new doors for me to be a product manager and own products and focus on how to enhance the customer experience versus uh, the delivery of solutions. And so I spent the next eight years of my, my career um, working with different financial service products. I did home equity, I did e-commerce, I did digital payments. Um, and I learned a lot about what's important to the customer, what, how to think about what features to build to address customers' needs. And that was a really great journey. But my last role at, in, in product management, uh, from product management, this oppor uh, an opportunity came up to uh, build out an enterprise authentication governance program. And I was able to leverage my project management skills and my product management skills um, to build this uh, framework that covered the whole uh, banking enterprise, the consumer, commercial, all the different products. And um, it was kind of like a crash course and everything fraud and identity because I had to interview the people in the different uh, products and channels to understand what they were doing and to um, find out what technologies were in place today, what technologies were being evaluated for future, how the bad guys were exploiting it. And so that really helped me understand the fraud and identity landscape. And so I built a, a, a structure, a program that would ensure that the bank was consistently um, asking the same kind of level of questions across the organization to provide, a, a fortify the wall across the organization. Um, that role kind of really pivoted my career into the cybersecurity space. Um, and I went there from there to Visa as a owner of a cybersecurity product, fraud and identity product. Uh, which ended up leading to my job here at LexisNexis. Um, and today, I not only support the financial services industry, but I support insurance, healthcare, and government. Um, so as just as a recap, because there's, there's so much to my career, um, but some of the key things that help this, you know, again, you know, I started out in e-commerce, went to retail, went to telecom, went to financial services, now in insurance, healthcare, and government. And I, hopefully you heard in that journey, like those transferable skills that kind of helped me make those leaps. And, um, you know, some of the education that I had to help me in my journey, you know, I, I did a translation program, I did an MBA, um, I, I started developing a passion around payments. Like as you grow in your career, you find those things that really attract you. And so you start start developing those interests more. So I got um, a pay, Visa Payments Professional program. I also developed uh, the and the extracurriculars. So in your in your job, you learn a certain set of skills, but in order to really grow your career to the next level, it's very helpful to also um, find other areas. So the education is one way to build additional tools into your toolbox but also having extracurricular activities helps you augment that portfolio skills. It helps you develop leadership skills. It helps you develop tech skills. It helps you develop relationships out of your job. And all these things will help you um, find that career path. Um, so some of the things I did is I built out a payments professional group. Um, I've uh, worked with different women's groups and kind of connecting people. Um, I was an active participant of BayPay, which was a, a payments professionals group where I could learn about cutting edge technology and build my network in the payment space. Um, Toastmasters was another place where I could continue to develop my speaking skills and also build my network. And um, more currently at LexisNexis, um, I'm the head of the Women in Tech ERG which I'm probably almost out of time here. So I'm just gonna very briefly touch a little bit on that because, um, you know, LexisNexis, you know, we've, we've seen from, you know, these women that have talked to you already today that it's a really great place to grow your career. The people here are really good. The culture is very supportive and collaborative. And um, in this company, you have the ability to not only do your day job, but to do that continuous learning 
Um, and to do those extracurriculars, we actually have a lot of different employee resource groups to uh, address you know, everybody's interests. Like if you have an interest, we probably have an employee resource group here. And um, with our goal with the, the Women in Tech ERG, this is something because of my, um, my passion for growth and my passion for helping other people and uh, my interest in technology, like um, I wanted to help the women in our company um, to grow, to help ensure that we had a, have balanced representation and to, to give women the forum to um, develop their skills in technology and, and in leadership. And so we have this women in techs group where we have um, a rather large board that represents the, all the different verticals in our organization. Um, and uh, we have different committees so that um, people have work-life balance, they can give back and, and participate and lead, but not be overwhelmed uh, with this activity. So we have committees that have um, a couple people in them and, and these women can create their vision and, and deliver on it. And so we last year we had we had a, an event every month, some things on data science or uh, uh, cloud technologies. We had leadership things. We had um, planning your career. We had lots of different topics. And one of the cool things that we delivered last year is we did a hackathon, um, which was super cool. It was like 90, uh, it was open to everybody, but we actually had 97% um, women participation. There was like 60 seven uh, folks that participate in this hackathon and it was amazing to see people come together. Um, so I guess in summary, I just wanna say like, as you're developing your career, make sure, understand that you're not trapped where you are. There's the world is your apple. You know, think about the skills that you have that can translate into the next job. Um, do that continuous learning, whether it's going to take extra classes or staying on top of distro lists. And, um, and, and get engaged in these extracurricular activities. That's really gonna help you make these big leaps in your career, get involved in things that you're passionate about. And that will also help direct your career in the areas that you're really interested in going. And then also uh, as a final thing, I guess if you're, if, uh, you know, LexisNexis is just a really great company. And if we have jobs here that catch your interest, you know, be sure to, you know, be happy to reach out and share more about what I know about those or connect you to people to do some informational networking. Um, you know, we have, we have a great place here that can really help you thrive in your career. And that's what I wanted to share today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marcia, Sophie, Jennifer and Angela. It has honestly been so amazing to hear from all of you. And we have um, five minutes to quickly have some Q&A. So um, firstly, I think it'd be good to go to Jennifer with the question, what advice would you give to someone with little experience in data science wanted to enter the industry? How would you go about building your experience? Well, yeah, I mean, the short answer is the internet. Um, that's how I learned how to apply data science. There's a particularly good site called Coursera, um, which has courses, not just data science, they're on practically everything and they range from beginner to advanced. Um, I actually started a course the other week based on something I just wanted to learn for my career. Um, and yeah, there are a few platforms out there which you can use to code along. Um, so the ones that come to mind are Data Camp and Code Academy, um, and they like prompt you where to answer and um, tell you where you're going right and wrong. And yeah, really useful tools to get yourself started. Awesome, thank you so much. Maybe we can go to Emma's question next, which says, what if a promotion is not exactly what you desired? For example, I've been offered an opportunity to working in project management, but I really don't have any desire. Should I still consider? So I think maybe Sophie can take this one. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, I know I said um, during my presentation, um, take every opportunity. Um, I think take that with a slight pinch of salt. If, if you absolutely know um, project management isn't for you, then you know don't take it just for the sake of it being a promotion. However, the advice I would give is don't discount it until you have all the information at hand. Um, is there the, the, the possibility to discuss what the role could entail? Could you potentially tailor the role? Um, for example, the role I've just taken on, um, I was very keen that um, I kept very hands on and had my own programs to manage. I didn't just want it to be a managerial role. Um, and those are the expectations I set um, before I accepted the role. Um, so I definitely think explore absolutely as much as possible, ask questions um, and then only discount once you've kind of got all the information at hand. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, maybe we can move to Angela next. Would you be able to 
to answer how did LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group support you as a mother? Um, I think you mentioned it in your slides as well. Yes, um, it, it, I was actually concerned when becoming a new mother because um, I uh, didn't know about flexibility and the different challenges that I would have performed during the duties of my job. But um, uh, after an honest conversation with my leadership, uh, those concerns were alleviated and uh, not only alleviated, but they were, uh, I, I felt comfortable um, managing my schedule. They were very flexible with my schedule. Um, I uh, work uh, almost uh, remotely for, for a good part of, of, of that time, maybe about two years. I was allowed to work remotely um, to be closer to, to my child. And that was even, you know, that was a while ago when um, remote working wasn't a norm when we were all going to the office. That has been, has been a number of years ago. And even now more with the pandemic, uh, my child is now 10 years old. I have been able to, to help her out uh, during the pandemic with school learning. And the company has been very supportive, not only with flexibility, but also giving us resources um, uh, that are free to us to, to help uh, support our, not only our children, but other members of our family. Oh, that really is good to know that LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group is ahead of the curve. And just to finish then, Marcia, um, we have a comment that says, I love how diverse your career journey is. What do you wish you knew when you started your career? Um, you know, I guess I, I, I wish I knew like that I could be, that, that that kind of opportunity, those paths were open to me. Because when I uh, was young, just graduating of the BFA uh, with kids, um, I, I guess I, I was not seeing the world as big and full of opportunities as it was. I thought I was trapped. I'm like, where can I go with an art degree? Um, but personally, I've had the most amazing career. I've loved every job I've ever been in. I've had some really, really amazing experiences. And I don't know what the future holds, but I know there's still a lot more because it's like, you know, whenever I find a passion, I follow it and it opens more doors. And so that's what I would recommend is that you don't know where you're gonna go, but just know that there's lots of really cool stuff out there that you don't even know you can tap into. So just keep at learning and keep tapping into those passions and join things that catch your interest because that's gonna open doors that open your interests, you know, are tied to your interests. So that's, that's what, yeah, I've, I've had, you know, so I wish I knew that. I wish I knew that that a long time ago, but um, it's been a good journey. Awesome, thank you so much. So I don't know how, but that has gone so, so, quickly and it's been truly um, incredible to listen to every single one of our speakers so I just wanted to thank them once again and also Jordan and also Lexus Nexus Risk Solutions Group as a whole as well. Um, I know that many of us in the audience have many burning questions that are still to be answered. Please do not worry, these will still get answered um, by sending an email so you'll get a direct response as well. Um, and very kindly Jordan has also put his LinkedIn, um, so he's one of the tech recruiters at Lexus Nexus Risk Solutions Group. Please do connect with him as well to get some more information if you are interested in joining. So once again, thank you all so much and I hope you all have a very lovely rest of your day. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you guys, take care.